Well, welcome back to the show. We're talking about the visit of the President of the Republic of Korea to China this week and its implications for relations between the two neighboring countries. Let's get back to our panel. If Shin, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said uh, earlier this week that he's prepared to sit down with the DPRK, have talks with them on this nuclear issue without preconditions. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. We're ready to talk anytime North Korea would like to talk. And we're ready to have the first meeting without precondition. Let's just meet. And let's, we can talk about the weather if you want. We can talk about whether it's going to be a square table or a round table, if that's what you're excited about. <laughs> but can we at least sit down and, and see each other face to face? Now, since that offer, which was made by Rex Tillerson, there has been a condition attached. The United States is now saying that uh, the DPRK must refrain from what it called further provocations if these talks are to take place. Is the United States likely to engage in some meaningful dialogue with Pyongyang? You know, the question also becomes that on define further provocations, right? I mean, yeah. you know, because there's also some in the Trump administration who say that, um, you know, North Korea must show meaningfully that they're rolling back. Um, their nuclear uh, program. So I think Rex Tillerson is right. Look, at the end of the day, um, you know, we're in a situation where um, the, only way to, the only way to get a meaningful solution is for there to be U.S.-North Korea talks. Yes, six-party talks are important, absolutely. China should be involved, and, and, and Japan should be involved, and, and South, South Korea should be involved. But the principal antagonists here are the United States and North Korea, and they need to be at the negotiating table. So Rex Tillerson is right, despite the fact that he was undermined, what, 24 hours after he said this, made this statement? The other thing is that there was a very senior Republican senator who made a comment today, Lindsey Graham, who said that there is a 70% chance the United States would attack the DPRK if more tests are carried out. Yes, yeah. yeah. Lindsey Graham is making these kind of statements, you know, with regularity, and I'm not sure where he's getting uh, the, his, his information, particularly with the precision of, of saying a 70% chance. Look, at the end of the day, um, everybody understands that if, if there were to be a war on the Korean Peninsula, the brunt of the pain would be felt by South Korea. Uh, um, and it would not be felt by the United States. And in fact, Lindsey Graham often talks about that. We need to strike so the pain is felt over there and the pain is not felt over here. Look, this is about as serious an issue that the international community faces. Uh, you know, it, North Korea is simply not going to turn back the clock on its nuclear program. So we're going to have to be engaged in creative diplomacy uh, to get to a meaningful solution that will probably, as with all negotiations, all sides will walk away from the table feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Okay, I want to change focus now and go back to Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, to Myung Koo Kang and talk about trade. Uh, trade, obviously a very important issue for South Korea and President Moon. He took a big delegation of businessmen with him, almost 300 businessmen accompanied him. Um, what do you think he's hoping to get out of this visit? Out of this visit, uh, I mean, the, the going back to the previous level of you know, strong uh, trade and business relations between the two countries, I mean, restoring the previous you know, thought crisis level would be very critical. And at this time, as at the beginning of today's show, the reporter made it quite clear, it's the biggest business delegation uh, accompanying the Korean president. For the, uh, so the thing is that South Korean uh, major uh, big business owners accompany this uh, visit. And it means that South Korean government and the business community is they are really serious about improving uh, economic relations with China. Uh, I think that the meeting will be quite successful so far, as far as, far as I understand. You know, Korean news report uh, overall meeting has been going pretty well, and, and I think it, the, the consequence would be really positive. By the way, I just want to mention a little bit about you know, the, uh, the North Korean issue briefly. Is it okay? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, one of the biggest uh, significant meaning of this summit meeting is that both presidents agree to a uh, peaceful resolution is the only acceptable solution in dealing with North Korean crisis. So according to South Korean reports, they seem to have re agreed, you know, four major principles. The first one is war must not be allowed and denuclearized of the Korean Peninsula 
and peaceful resolution of the Korea, uh, North Korean crisis and supporting inter-Korea exchange or further cooperation. So basic message is that peaceful resolution is the only acceptable solution in dealing with the North Korean crisis. As we know well, as you pointed out, you know, Senator Lindsey Graham here in the United States, and many people are talking about we are running out of time, running out of time. So it's kind of urgency feeling and military option, including regime change, is the only uh, possible solution in dealing with the North Korean crisis. In that context, this summit meeting made it quite clear, I mean, delivered a clear message to the right. U.S. government and those policymakers. I think that's a very important point. So getting back to trade, uh, South Korea wants to be part of China's Belt and Road Initiative. This is China's big signature development globalization mm -hmm. plan. Yes. Uh, what can China do for South Korea then? I think uh, this is uh, one of the very significant uh, achievements for, um, from Mr. Uh, Moon's uh, visit. And uh, we know <coughs> OBR is now moving ahead and uh, many, uh, many developed countries are so joining. And uh, this uh, Japan has already announced its interest uh, to, to join. And uh, uh, I think South Korea is very uh, keen to benefit economically. And we see a lot of uh, cooperations already happening neighboring South Korea in this uh, northeast uh, provinces of uh, China. And uh, a lot of projects can be expected. I think uh, uh, South Korean companies uh, will have a big hope to join and benefit from it. So, Nguyen, President Xi also said that he wants to see um, an increase in exchanges in education, students, that is, you know, science, technology. We heard that from our reporter as well. Media, health, tourism. Um, and, you know, so Chinese visiting South Korea, that uh, has, has been hit. Those numbers have gone down uh, over the past year, and they want to bring that up to where it used to be. Um, what do you see happening there? I mean, this is pretty ambitious, isn't it? It is pretty ambitious. I um, very much would like to point out to Professor Kang's comment earlier about the issue of mistrust or lack of trust. So between the two countries, unless those two peoples, those two societies and those two governments have sufficient amount of trust towards each other and about confidence about each other not hurting our national interest, then we foreseeably will have future episodes like that where China and South Korea do not see eye to eye on an issue. So this type of social exchanges, people-to-people -people exchanges, are highly important in terms of building that trust between the two. So, Shin, we have you know, complex issues here that are being discussed, especially security issues and the question of trust, as uh, Sun Yun just pointed out. Uh, what needs to happen uh, at the end of this visit for it to be called a success? No, I, I, think that, I think the visit, just the fact that the visit is taking place uh, means that the China-South Korea relationship is on the mend and therefore, you know, can be seen as a success. Uh, you know, and I think this is a good example of how uh, the integration of Asia that we've seen, particularly um, of Northeast Asia, as I said, China, South Korea, and Japan, um, is really driving the geopolitics uh, of Northeast Asia as well. Um, at the end of the day, uh, maybe both sides would not have made such an effort if the, re the trade relationship was not so robust. And, and to, to the point of the, the Belt and Road, Anand, you know, South Korea will benefit as long as China keeps laying down infrastructure across East Asia, connecting to Africa and elsewhere. South Korea is going to benefit because, as all, many of the countries in Asia will benefit from that infrastructure of connectivity and the supply chains that are really binding uh, Asia together these days. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for joining us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. Thanks.